ME204, Conservation of Angular Momentum. We've established the angular impulse and momentum equation as what we have listed here. What if I choose a system such that there are no external impulses? In that case, I would eliminate my moment times the change in time, and my equation would look something like this. In this case, I have conservation of angular momentum. There's no external moments or forces, so the momentum is conserved. Here's a couple of examples. Have you ever watched figure skaters and how they're able to spin faster or slower by simply moving their arms in and out? The same thing is what's happening with these videos that you're watching. As my arms move in, my angular velocity increases. Why is this happening? Well, it has to do with conservation of angular momentum. I have an initial mass moment of inertia and an initial angular velocity and when I move my arms in, my mass moment of inertia changes. If my mass moment of inertia is reduced, then in order to have conservation of angular momentum, my angular velocity will have to increase. For example, if I have a mass moment of inertia of 10 and an angular velocity of 10, and then when I pull my arms in, my mass moment of inertia changes to 5, in order to have conservation of angular momentum, my angular velocity has to go to 20. If my mass moment of inertia were to reduce to 2, then my angular velocity would increase to 50. Here's another application of angular momentum. We have to remember that angular momentum is a vector and our direction matters. When we have conservation of angular momentum, that angular momentum wants to stay conserved. So, for example, if I have a bicycle wheel that I spin, as I spin that wheel, there's a direction associated with that rotation. There's an angular momentum associated with it. And it wants to conserve that, so it tries to stay in the position that it's originally put at. So if I spin the wheel and hold it at a certain angle and let go of the wheel, it'll try to stay at that angle. No matter what angle I put that wheel at, it'll try to stay at that angle to conserve its angular momentum. It takes an external impulse in order to change the angular momentum. So the spinning object resists any change in the direction of its axis of rotation and it has a stabilizing effect to the system. How does the angular momentum help to stabilize motorcycles? Well, as the wheel spins, we have an angular momentum that occurs. There's also angular momentum that's occurring in the spinning of the engine as well. So let's look at the gyroscopic effects of motorcycle wheels and the spinning engine. If I have a motorcycle that has a weight, mg, as is drawn on our figure here, and as I drive down the road I have an angular momentum from the spinning of the wheels and the spinning of the engine. If I then lean on my motorcycle, my angular momentum would change to be perpendicular to that wheel and the rotation of the wheel. However, the resultant vector wants to remain unchanged. In order to stabilize that, there's a rotation that's induced in this direction, rotating about the z-axis. So when I lean left, the bike will then turn left. If I lean right, the bike will turn right. This is due to conservation of angular momentum. Here's another example. Let's say I've got a satellite up in space and it's got a couple of big flat panels that are rotating around a central cylinder. The whole system is rotating about an axis that goes through the center of the cylinder. So initially I have a mass moment of inertia for the cylinder and I have a mass moment of inertia for each of the plates and that mass moment of inertia is about the z-axis. If I combine these mass moments of inertia and shift everything towards the point of rotation, my shifted mass moment of inertia includes the mass moment of inertia of the cylinder plus the two plates, so I have two, times the mass moment of inertia of the plate about its center of gravity plus the mass of the plate times the distance from the center of gravity of the plate to the point of rotation using the parallel axis theorem. I could then use that mass moment of inertia to calculate my angular momentum. Now what if I turned those plates so the plates start to rotate about the y-axis and they flatten out. Once they flatten out, my mass moment of inertia for the plates have changed. The cylinder stays the same, but for the plate, 
my mass moment of inertia about their center of gravity about the z-axis becomes 1 twelfth the mass of the plate times a squared plus b squared where a squared and b squared are the dimensions of the plate then my shifted mass moment of inertia changes so if my mass moment of inertia has changed from the before state to the after state stage one then we would expect that my angular velocity would also change now let's say i take those plates and fold them up so that we have something different here at stage two and now we have a distance c that's measured from the center of the cylinder to the center of mass for the plates again the cylinder's mass moment of inertia doesn't change but the plate now changes to one twelfth the mass of the plate times the length a squared again my shifted mass moment of inertia has changed however angular momentum is conserved so the mass moment of inertia from the before state times its angular velocity will be equal to the mass moment of inertia of stage one times its angular velocity which will also be equal to the mass moment of inertia of stage two times its angular velocity so as my shifted mass moment of inertia changes from the beginning stage to stage one to stage two my angular velocities will also change respectively here's another example let's say I have a dart that has a mass of 25 grams it's traveling at 15 meters per second and it strikes and embeds into a one kilogram wooden sphere suspended by a 0.5 kilogram slender rod we want to find the angular velocity of the rod and the ball just after the dart embeds itself into the sphere. The length of the rod is 0.67 meters and the diameter of the sphere is 0.22 meters. What will we choose for a system? Well, we want to choose a system that will allow us to use conservation of angular momentum. If I choose the whole thing as a system, then I have a situation where I have conservation of angular momentum because all of the forces and moments are internal to the system. Any forces that are occurring at the pin are in line with the point of rotation, and so they don't contribute to the moment of momentum. So if I summarize my problem up at the top right-hand corner, the initial velocity of the dart of 15 meters per second, the mass of the dart is 25 grams, the mass of the rod is 0.5 kilograms, and the mass of the sphere is 1 kilogram, we'll start by writing my conservation of angular momentum equation our dart is being treated as a particle and only has a linear momentum in the initial state. Before the dart strikes the sphere, there's no rotation in this problem. So I can drop out the mass moment of inertia times the angular velocity, the beginning part of the problem. Once the dart embeds into the sphere, it becomes part of the sphere and I don't have the translation anymore. The whole thing will be rotating together. So my mass times the velocity times the perpendicular distance or my moment of momentum for the dart in the second part of the problem is eliminated by combining it with the mass moment of inertia of the whole system. So the final equation that I'll have is the mass of the dart times its initial velocity times its perpendicular distance or the moment of momentum will be equal to the shifted mass moment of inertia for the system times its angular velocity. Now I just need to find what that shifted mass moment of inertia is. For the rod, the mass moment of inertia is 1 12th the mass times the length squared. And for the sphere, it's 2 fifths the mass times the radius squared. If I put all of that into an equation to shift it to our point of rotation where the pin is located, then the rod is shifted by adding to its mass moment of inertia, the mass of the rod times the distance from its center of mass to the pin, which is L over 2 squared using the parallel axis theorem. For the sphere, we add to its mass moment of inertia about its center of gravity, the mass of the sphere, times the length of the rod plus the radius of the sphere. That would be the distance from the center of the sphere to the pin, and then we square that quantity. Now, I have an extra term on the end of this equation. It's the mass of the dart times the length of the rod plus the radius of the sphere squared. Notice that I don't have a mass moment of inertia for the dart. We're treating the dart as a particle. So we assume that it doesn't have any shape, and so we just need to shift its mass to the point of rotation. So it's like having the parallel axis theorem with the mass times the distance squared, only our mass moment of inertia about the center of gravity is zero. Now that I have a shifted mass moment of inertia, I can substitute that into my equation. And knowing that the distance from the dart to the point of rotation initially is the length of the rod plus the radius of the sphere. I can then substitute in the values that I know and I'm left with angular velocity over at the very end of the problem here.
Running the calculations and reducing the equation, we get 0 0.2925 kilograms meters squared per second is equal to 0 0.7033 kilograms meters squared times the angular velocity. Solving for the angular velocity, we get an angular velocity of 0 0.416 radians per second immediately after the dart embeds itself into the wooden sphere. This is the end of the course content for ME204. Thank you for your participation.